This is Farfetch Threads, our people podcast, where you can hear the real stories about life as a farfetcher. Hello and welcome everyone to Farfetch Threads, our people podcast. Um, I'm Vivian Parisky, Senior Retail Transformation Manager at Farfetch. And today I'll be talking to Holly Rogers, Chief Brand Officer at Farfetch and Chair at Browns, and Katie Butcher, Visual Experience Director at Browns. We'll be talking on the topic of the future of retail and the new Browns flagship store, Browns Brook Street in London. For those who don't know, uh, Browns has been part of the Farfetch family since 2015, and that's when you joined, Holly. Uh, Katie, you've been part of Browns since 2017, and personally I've been lucky enough to work with you two and the Browns team for the last three years now. So, hi Holly, hi Katie, how are you today? Hi Vivian, good. Um, As we sit here and watch torrential downpour, then sunshine, then torrential downpour, because it's London. (laughs) The beauty of of May. Mm, Exactly. (laughs) Amazing. So, um, I wanted to start our conversation with a quick fire round, just to get, you know, you warmed up. Um, I'll ask some fashion or browns related questions and you'll need to answer with just one sentence. So are you ready? Yeah. Great. So we'll start with Holly and then Katie, you'll, um, you'll answer after that. So first question, what are you wearing today, ladies? Um, a Bodhi top, some Loewe trousers. And when I do put shoes on, <laughs> some JW Anderson slides. And I'm wearing a Jean J shirt and uh, Marco Di Vincenzo boots with a mirrored heel that actually nearly made me fall off my bike earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, second question, best Browns purchase, either before you joined or after you joined Browns? Um, the way I like to look at it, my best Browns purchase has yet to come. like it. Uh, I think my best Browns purchase was last year and um, someone told me that over the age of 40 you can't wear animal print so I saw a dress that had snake and leopard on it and so I bought it just to annoy that particular person and it's amazing, it's from Burberry. I want to know why you can't, I thought that was when you were supposed to fully embrace it. Yeah. Agree. That's what my mom thinks anyway. (laughs) She's so right. Amazing. Um, And the third and last one is, what is your most memorable in-store event or collaboration? I always like to go to either the future or the most recent, um, because there are so many great ones. But um, I think probably the collaboration with Demore on the Brook Street store, to be honest with you. I think it really just brought that to life in a way that um, is super meaningful for the next, as we say, the next 50 years. So I think that for me, that and the collaboration with my team who helped deliver it, which is pretty amazing, including yourselves. I think for me, um, one of my favorite projects in the store was when we did um, a miniature pub in Browns East in our store in Shoreditch. It was just so hilarious and realistic, and we had it was amazing. It was, it was so good, and we had so much fun installing it. We even poured beer on the carpet to make it smell of pub, and <laughs> it was just so much fun. And it looked so real. It really, when you closed the door, it was just amazing. It felt like you were in a pub. Yeah, yeah. I remember that one. And we played darts. Oh, we yeah. did quite a few rounds of darts. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, so now that we're all warmed up, um, we can go into the tough questions. Let's start with our first question. Um, In our first Farfish Thread podcast last year, we um, questioned the concept of luxury that can sometimes be a bit alienating. So, Holly, this question is for you. Um, How would you define luxury and the luxury experience? And then what is Brown's vision of luxury? I have such a funny experience with the word luxury. I grapple with it all the time because I just feel like it's a word that's like abused and overly used and people use it crazily to describe paper towels and things. So I've always been, I have always had a little bit of an allergy of of speaking to it. And that was one of the things when we um, were, when I started six years ago and we were putting together like our vision and our mission and our brand ethos and you know to try and encapsulate what browns is and i think at the end at the end of the day we sell luxury clothing we do 
I mean, that is without a doubt. But it has a whole level of connotation to it that I wanted to make sure we kind of steered away from. Because for some reason, it doesn't seem to also connote cool. And I think that was something that I wanted to make sure to imbue in everything that we were doing was the fact that it could be absolutely cool and it could still speak luxury. And I think it's about an edit. But I think luxury also is just... I mean, as we all talked about, it's time. Now we've all had tons of time in the last year. So the luxury now is actually going out. And so I think luxury just changes and shifts with the times as well. And it's it's something that's precious, ultimately. And whatever that precious thing is, tangible or intangible, is defined by the person. I think for Browns, it's the new Brook Street store for me is basically kind of the pinnacle of luxury it's that integration of like incredible luxury product so all the designer brands that we carry and we know um, how many of them take a, such a considered approach to how they make their garments where they're made you know the conscious element of it as well um and then the space in which we have the, the store itself all the the work that's gone into that that's luxury because so many details were considered through the whole journey, not, I mean, physical and otherwise. And the fact that, you know, the, the courtyard is so considered and I mean, like literally every step of it. So to me, that is luxury when someone has spent the time to think about it. And we've walked quite a few people through there in the last couple of weeks. And that is one thing that everyone just kind of, really is blown away by it's just the sheer eye for detail and to me that's also luxury and I think that's luxury for Browns right now too is really moving into that space and it's also that connecting with the customer I think for me that's the other really important layer of all this is like how do you connect with the customer and give them an experience that they won't actually get anywhere else so and I think that's something that we have hopefully well I'm pretty confident we have achieved in this new space but obviously we've only been open three weeks so we'll see how um, things progress but I think it will probably hopefully only get better so sorry if that was a rather long-winded answer no but I quite like it because also it's about people you know um, uh, sure yeah and that's and that's super important um, yeah I mean the sales associates are like such a critical part of that too you know particularly in this environment is like all the training that they've they've gone through not only to how to, to speak to the technology layer that we have in the store, but also how they speak to the store itself, how they speak to um, the history of the building, the architects that we partnered with. You know, there's so much training that's gone on. And all of that, again, is like detail and it's a role that they play, that inspiring um, educational space that they sit in. It's a really, really empowered space, but it's also... Um, it's luxury, right? To be able to have somebody know all that information and be able to share it with you and take the time to do that. It's pretty special. Yeah, definitely. Um, so talking about and going a little bit more into, into um, Brook Street. So we recently um, opened it on April 12th. But over the last few years, we've also opened a few other stores, Browns East in 2017 and a few other Nomad concepts in LA and Berlin. Um, and now obviously coming back to London and opening this, this flagship and pushing the boundaries of retail. So in this current climate where, you know, we all know and we've all seen many retailers closing and e-commerce booming, um, I, I have another question for you, Holly. Why, why did you choose to reinvest in physical retail and opening this new store? What do you think it means? Um, no, I mean, you know, it's funny. I've been asked that question so many times, Vivian, through um, you know, all the journalists that we've spoken to in the run-up to launching the store. And it's, it's a super valid question because you do have to consider, like, what are you doing in that space? And I think one of the things that was really paramount in the vision for Browns was that experience. So online was like critical number one topic that we had to make sure that we tackled, get that running, get that scalable, make it a great user journey. And then 
the stores, what do the stores mean? The story, the stores are experience and that's solely what they're doing. It's, it's experience. It's kind of, you know, my, my history was predominantly like my work history was predominantly set in pure play online retail. And so I kind of came into this with not a huge amount of expectation around like, what should a store environment be? Like I, I, and I kind of liked that I didn't have all those preconceived notions necessarily. It's like, okay, what else, what can it be? Not instead of what, what is it? And I think that's, you know, we've had to do a lot of education through the years of kind of changing people's ideas about what, you know, this, this idea of sales per square foot to justify everything you do. And I'm not, I'm not knocking it at all. I think that that's been very, very much a need for um, a huge number of retailers globally but where we sit and what we're trying to stand for is like, what's the future of retail? What's the future of physical retail? And, you know, coming from that online space, I realized actually that it's, it's also kind of like what's going on in the world. And you've got, nobody believed you could sell luxury online. Okay. So that was disproven. Then people believed that, oh my God, the high street's decimated because online is just going to get this huge uptake. And, and yeah, that happened, you know, there was a good amount of movement for, you know, a good decade onto online, but still, if you looked at the luxury market, it still was only maybe 22% of all luxury goods were being purchased online. Of course, then no one first saw COVID coming along and then obviously just aggressively moved the needle on, on online sales. But what it definitely did, and we were already in that space was reinforce the need to have a physical environment that did something different than just rack up a bunch of clothes or, you know, a bunch of product because you can get that anywhere. You can get that online. And I think that's the thing that's now, I think it's made online like overly functional quite possibly. And now the physical environment is this other like new terrain. So what do you do with it? Like let's pioneer this space. And I kind of feel like that's what we're trying to do with, with Browns and Shoreditch um, beast as we love to call it the beast in the east um, you know that was like how do we pack in and it was one of those experiences that Katie was speaking to earlier this immersive space that is meaningful things it's not like just oh whatever throw some old crap in there and someone will be excited by it it's like what's actually going to engage your community your audience speak to what's relevant speak to you as a brand you know revolving uh, all kinds of um, like restaurant collaborations that Katie went out and found the coolest like hot chocolate makers in town and hopefully didn't get us too fat um, through that process. <laughs> um, you know, we learned how to breathe. We, I mean, there were so many amazing things that we had in that store that's super engaging. And, but it was also like the, the shift of product and how you merchandise that product in the store space and um, the gender fluidity of that space. And then, you know, so conceptually just recognizing that you know, people might walk out the door and not buy anything. And that's OK, because you've engaged them on a certain level. And at some point, they just as long as they're in your ecosystem, that's actually what matters the most because everybody re, like most people research online now, particularly now. So then the nomads were just another way to engage people in different markets. And I think that was the actually really fun part. And it's you know challenging for us internally because everything we do is in the UK. That was the first time we'd done anything in the US and the first time we've done anything in Germany in a physical space. But it's a lot of fun. You know, we got tons of people engaged who didn't know about the Browns brand and LA was two months. Berlin was three days. And um, so, yeah, I very much believe in physical a hundred percent. I think it's really critical now how much of a footprint does one need is entirely up to them. I don't think that Browns needs a giant footprint in terms of physical space, but what you do do, you do it really well. And I think the flagship for me, it was really critical that we got that right. We've had one for 50 years previously that had, um, I think it's run, it had run its course. <laughs> you know, it's, it served its purpose and it was great, but it was time to move on. And this, like the gift of this new flagship is just um, special, really special. Yeah. 
And I really like this word ecosystem you use because it's all about, you know, thinking about it holistically and not just those different channels that are separate. Um, exactly. And, and the fact that it's fun. I think <laughs> Brown's done yeah. really well. <laughs> yeah, we tried. I mean, at the end of the day, we work in fashion. That's what we always say. It's like we work in fashion and all of us love one, we love fashion. We love what we do. We try to work with a really great group of people, you know, the brands we work with as well and the people that we collaborate with. You know, all of it is like you want to come into this world. Like, you know, one of the mantras we use through the years is it's cool to be kind. And that's another definition of cool. But it's that whole idea of like, you should be able to be successful and be nice and do, you know, good things for other people and support people and, um, and I think that's all part of that ecosystem. But yeah, having fun. Yeah. So Katie, actually, we've been talking about this flagship about Brook Street, but could you um, try and take our listeners through the store and and uh, what, you know, if they would just walk through the doors right now, what would they see? What happens next? Can you take us a little bit through, through a bit of a guided tour? Mm, there's, there's so much to describe. No. Um, Okay, so it's a it's a three hundred year old grade two star listed building. So if you can kind of imagine how that looks, and we've we've blended that with a kind of modernity. Um, so you get this really interesting kind of intersection of the historic aspects with the kind of newer look kind of fixturing and I think it creates a really interesting aesthetic throughout on the ground floor you've got focus area which is where we kind of curate monthly a completely different concept so it could be around an exclusive launch or a brand that we really love or a category like conscious that we might be talking about at that point so that's an interesting space because it will always change so it means that whoever's coming in on a repeat basis will always see something new and different and then the rest of the ground floor is is unisex um and we actually then have men's floors and women's floors completely just uh for those categories and we have a club floor for our vics which is kind of um a really interesting space because it would have originally been the servants quarters so it's got much lower ceilings and it's it's kind of this sort of series of quite sort of private cocoon um super luxe kind of uh rooms uh, where you can have a store for one setup especially for you and then we have kind of non-retail sort of um, components like Holly had just described the immersive room so we have one of those again and we've got this amazing installation um, by this photographer called Juno Calypso in there at the moment um, again those will rotate and always be different and fresh so there's always something new to come and look at and then we have um, the parlor as well, where we will be hosting residencies, um, services, uh, hair, nails, tattoos, loads of different things. And then um, the cherry on the cake, I think, is the, the garden and the restaurant, um, which is, again, like a, a slightly different aesthetic to the main store. It's it's got a different architect and it's much more based around the ideas of uh recycled materials and local artisans and uh yeah it looks quite different in there um and yeah the courtyard is 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 just uh, you know this idea of this sort of secret garden in the middle of the city and i think it really is that it's something quite quite special and unique yeah it's amazing it's absolutely incredible so um, we've worked on this for on this project um, for roughly the past two years. Not that we're counting, um, and, but it I was, think it was longer than that. Or, but anyway. yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least for sure for you two, because you were really at. I mean, you started this, so yeah, it's definitely longer than that. 
but it was also a, a truly collaborative effort between, you know, the Browns teams and Farfetch, you know, looking at this kind of cross-functional project. And that um, is also quite um, different in terms of ways of working. Um, a quite quick question for you, Holly. How did you, I mean, apart from obviously COVID happening in the middle of it, but how did you challenge yourself and the teams to deliver this project? Yeah, I mean, I think COVID was probably one of the most challenging things any of us have dealt with ever. Um, but I think from the beginning, it was... The, the, one of the biggest challenges, to be honest with you, was just even finding the space. So I think we found, we eventually found the right space, um, figuring out the concept that would suit that 300 year old building where you can't make, um, you know, you can't affix, you know, certain things to the ceilings and the walls and you got to keep things in, in some cases as they are. I mean, obviously Katie can speak a lot better to that than I can. But I think all of that, and then on top of it, you know, obviously I think for us, one of the major um, things we wanted to achieve from this was that integration of the technology to bring us into the future. And that integration of that luxury new retail technology in particular from Farfetch. And, you know, how, and I think that was probably alongside all of the historical elements that we had to be, that had to be super considered was how do we then also overlay this technology into the space. But what technology was that? We've been trialing things in the Browns East store for a little while, for a couple years, and honing that conversation with the SAs, you know, sales associates and, and that store and your team, Vivian, and um, some of the other Farfetch teams. I've been really trying to figure out what makes sense for the customer. Cause I think that was probably one of the biggest deals that we were trying to figure out is like, yeah, it's great to have this technology. Oh, it's that fancy mirror that shows you all this stuff. And you know, that's either in your, your dressing room or on the website or whatever. That's great. But like, what does it mean? Like the why behind why we're doing all of this and, and you guys all really working so closely to figure out what that was. I think that was it. Like that was you know, some of the customer journey piece and, yeah. and how do you talk to all of that? So I think just challenging you guys in general about like, okay, this is what we want to do. How are you going to make it come to life? And I think that that you can probably speak to that, <laughs> how complicated that was, but yeah. And then you just for, you know, good measure, throw in things you would never ever in your life imagine happening like COVID. Yeah, exactly. But I, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, we really looked at that customer journey as our North Star almost and thinking also um, about the fact that a customer can come into that journey and start wherever they want, whether it's, you know, in store because they just stepped in and that's where they start the journey or they started online or it's a combination of both and, and really looking at that complexity was really fascinating sometimes you know we had a lot of heated discussions but I think it was really interesting to really look at that holistically but you had to I mean you had to have heated discussions because I yeah. mean there was like no simple answer right because that was the whole point of the work that you guys were doing I mean Luke told me about how you two sat down on the floor in um, the immersive room at Beast and laid all these papers out and we're figuring out, mapping it out basically. And I'm sure you did that on numerous occasions, just trying to work it out. Cause that's just it. You know, I think the time that's been spent, the sheer time that's been spent on figuring all of these things out on behalf of the customer. The thing is, unless they listen to this podcast, they're never going to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which I, I guess is like the beauty of it, you know, it's that the simplicity, what comes across yeah. as simplicity is very thought through. And again, it's that attention to detail. Yeah, exactly. And you, it's almost about, you know, kind of like in ballet, like everything is really complicated, but it seems so easy, right? Yeah. It seems so effortless. Simple. Yeah, effortless. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, be and beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, so... We obviously talked about quite, you know, having quite a few surprises and, and unexpected memories. So, Katie, can you maybe share one or two unexpected memories from working on this project? 
So um, w one part of the store, which is which is really important to the history of, of the space, is the fact that Colfax and Fowler, who are a wallpaper and fabric um, brand, they actually inhabited the space for, I think, around 70 years. Um, and we love that part of the story. And we actually kind of um, used a lot of wallpapers throughout, but we also actually left some of the walls as we found them and, and with the kind of degraded, peeling off, really beautiful wallpapers. And I kept sort of finding these little spots that we were we, we decided to keep. And there was one area that I think originally we were going to paint over and then decided to keep it because it just had this really gorgeous texture of the wallpaper and the, the plaster sort of over the top of it. And I saw that it had a bit of writing and a phone number on it, but I just thought, you know what? It's just part, it's just part, part of it, we'll leave it. And um, no one really said anything and it stayed there and then, um, I think one time Holly asked me, oh, whose phone number is that? And I said, I don't, I don't know, it's always been there. So um, Holly, being Holly, decided to call the phone number and say, <laughs> who's that? Um, and it turned out that it was one of the very cheeky builders who thought it was funny to write his phone number on the wall. Um, but I think he was very surprised to receive a phone call from Holly and uh, subsequently <laughs> uh, said he was going to come immediately and rub it off the wall. <laughs> Well, it was actually really funny because when I realized when I was dialing it, I was like, "Oh gosh, what do I say? How do, how do I put this?" I was like, um, "Your number's on a wall in my store," <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, is it Browns?" And I was like, "Oh, how do you know that?" <laughs> It's still there, by the way, Holly. He, he has sure a problem. He's, he's probably a little like part, part of the story now of the store. Exactly. And so now people who are listening to this, they can come in the store and then try and find where the number is. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> it's not readily visible. I mean, it's actually, that's one of the things is that you, you can see it if you're looking, but even then it's not the easiest. Yeah. But apparently a lot of people had discussed the phone number and no one was willing to call it to see. <laughs> so I was like, I'll do it. Why not? <laughs> of course. Okay. <laughs> I love that story. Um, so, Katie, I have another question for you, actually. Um, because obviously 2020 was, you know, marked by this little thing called COVID. Um, but it taught us to be resilient and, and, you know, really adapt our plans over and over and over again. Um, quite happy about that. But, Katie, you really worked with teams across different countries. I mean, you had the architects in Italy, you had the, the you know, tech teams, the Farfetch teams in Portugal, and also obviously London, and then also you worked with other people and teams across the UK. So how did you really embrace this complexity and, and really manage to deliver a store, a physical store, while also having limited access to the space? Tell us your secret. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's any particular secret, but um, yeah, it was certainly really challenging and there was definitely a few things that happened that were you know not exactly as planned and I think I think that's just because it was such a challenge you know normally in in these types of projects you're traveling so much you're traveling to see the furniture being made wherever it's being made and you've got the designers coming to you to check things you're painting swatches on the wall to decide, you know, there's so many things. And, you know, we couldn't do so many of them. Um, it was a case of, you know, the builders holding up an iPhone to, to, to the wall and trying to show us stuff. And, you know, we did the best we could. And there's, there's probably a couple of things in there that could have been better if we'd have been able to do it IRL. But, you know, it all turned out very well in the end. Um, but yeah, it was definitely very challenging. I think the worst part of it was the samples. So um, obviously you're working with lots and lots of samples and normally you would meet up and share the samples. But in this instance, we had to send samples around 
to uh, myself, to the designers, to the manufacturers. So I um, actually spent an enormous amount of time in the post office queue near my house, posting <laughs> samples. So a lot of the time that you were talking to me, I was probably in the post office queue. <laughs> Who would have imagined it, right? I know. And that was one of the only things you could do for any sort of um, entertainment. So there are probably a lot of people in that queue. <laughs> yes. yes, indeed. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're, we're on to our final question now, um, actually. But I wanted to hear a little bit from you, Holly, about... Um, the far-fetched luxury new retail vision um, and where Browns in particular, you know, this Brook Street store uh, fits into that overall strategy. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is um, a project that's definitely been in the works for quite a while. I and mean, I think when Sandrine Devo, who, who runs the team and that you're a part of, Vivian, um, started, it was at the same time as myself. And I think it was with the vision to open store of the future. I mean, that's essentially what Jose's uh, vision was for, for what we were to be doing. And so it's been, you know, very much a conjoined effort in terms of where we're taking this. What does the, the technology component of the store space look like? And, you know, we worked also um, with a wonderful outside consultant named Suzanne Typefreder. And, um, you know, she also, gave a lot to this project as well and kind of helped forming augmented retail for us as the precursor to LNR and, and recognizing the future of, of where retail is going. And, um, and I think it's just, I think it's just giving, you know, having the time to stop and think about what is this going to be? And I think that, you know, we, we all sit in this position of, you know, obviously so many people having worked on executing this last, this flagship meaning the last project, um, not the last project, because we'll do more, but <laughs> the one we just recently unveiled. Um, but for, for Farfetch as a business is, you know, trying to push the boundaries, that innovation space, and, you know, figuring out how all of this fits together, but in a physical environment, because they are, you know, they have 700 plus boutiques in the network and are on the marketplace. And how is it that you can continue to empower them in ways other than through just the marketplace. And this is also through the store technology and how I think, you know, as we see um, the, the game changing online a bit um, in terms of GDPR and the impacts that's having moved to maybe physical being even more important as I touched on earlier is this idea of the offline cookie, which is what Sandrine likes to use quite a lot, and and how that plays into, again, just that whole understanding of what the consumer's needs are, really talking to um, giving them a full service proposition. You know, it's, it's a 360 and trying to be there for them wherever they want to be. I think that's that's basically what, you know, how we try to approach it. Um, but Vivian, feel free to interject anything. No, I think what, what I also um, really, you know, think is powerful about our luxury new retail vision is that it's ever evolving. It's not stuck in, you know, True, one. Yes. Because not only tech obviously changes quite quickly, um, we know that, and so we we can't think of, you know, the technology that enables it. We have to start by, you know, the why we're doing it, what we're trying to achieve. And then we find the tech that is meaningful at a certain time, but that that changes and we have to adapt really quickly also. But mm -hmm. also I think, you know, the, the expectation of um, the luxury consumers are also evolving and we have to really stay in touch with that. And so that's what I think is really interesting is that, you have it keeps you on your toes right <laughs> and yeah for sure there's that that idea of just always thinking of how we can improve how we can do better and and um and yeah this this idea of this you know, train like that's ever moving basically well yeah i mean it's like and it's you know if we think about recently too like virtual try on which we launched only in in yeah. december yeah. with the watches on the browns app and 
with the really high, like the really expensive watches that we wanted to put on there. Cause we have some really amazing uh, watches, but we thought, how do you make it accessible and interesting for people? And it's kind of a game, right? As well. Cause not everybody can afford a half a million pound watch. And, um, but you can try it on and not be intimidated because you can do it in your own home and you can take a picture and show it off and all that good stuff. But the other component of that is like, how do you use that technology in the store, which sounds counterintuitive, Mm -hmm. right? So you're like, but, but you have stock there, but actually you can't have all your stock there all the time. And I think that that's been fun to watch that technology being used in the store. And I think that came off the back of like, just questions about, okay, we have this technology, how else can you use it that would be engaging for customers? And I think that's something that, you know, a lot of people come in and ask that question about like, but of course you can sit there and just try it on yourself, but then they'll understand. And I think that that's, it's really getting people used to some of those things. And I always say that, you know, part of our roles is to educate as well as inspire. And, um, you know, and it's, and it's interesting because as we stay curious about what's going on around us, and we see these things that um, pique our interest and we know they are getting some traction somewhere. There's no reason why we shouldn't be trying to figure out how to integrate that into the environment as you talk about, Vivian, exactly. Definitely. And it changes. And it changes. But it's interesting, too, though, that with all of this um, technology, it does change, but then it doesn't. Because some of this is the same stuff that's existed forever. Yeah. And I think technology has a tendency to talk about things in the very early MVP stages of things when they haven't actually been able to bring it to life or used it at scale. And then it seems like it takes forever for, you know, it to reach critical mass. And I think that's the thing is um, it'll be really interesting to see what those next stages are, but I know I'm pretty comfortable. We'll be right there with it. (laughs) Yes. It's very exciting. Um, So, this is quite a sad moment, but we've arrived at the end of this podcast. <laughs> How is that possible? I know, I know. We, I could, you know, we could keep on doing this forever, but obviously we have to wrap it up. But um, Holly and Katie, thank you so much for such a great conversation on today's episode of Farfetch Threads. Um, and thank you also to everyone who's been listening. So stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Viv. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Make sure you never miss an episode of Farfetch Threads by subscribing to our Spotify and Farfetch People YouTube channel. If you're ready to do what's never been done, visit farfetchcareers.com.